Hello everyone, welcome to my reinforcement learning course. This is our sixth lecture. In this lecture, we will study stochastic approximation and stochastic gradient descent. This diagram is an overview of the content of our course. After a long journey in the last lecture, we learned reinforcement learning algorithms based on the Monte Carlo method. This was our first introduction to model-free reinforcement learning algorithms. In the next lecture, we will study temporal difference learning a classic model-free reinforcement learning algorithm. From now on, all the algorithms we will study are model-free. Before proceeding to the next chapter, I would like to press the pause button and introduce stochastic approximation. Why? Because there is a knowledge gap. If you have not seen temporal difference learning before, you may find the algorithms very strange at first glance. You may be confused as to why the algorithms are designed this way. In fact, Temporal difference learning is a special case of stochastic approximation. You will see this later. So today we will first introduce the background knowledge. I hope you can arrange your study based on your interests. If you are eager to learn temporal difference learning, you can skip this lecture. Nevertheless, I strongly recommend that you patiently study this lecture. It will be very helpful for your subsequent study of temporal difference learning. Additionally, the mathematical tools that will be introduced today, such as stochastic gradient descent, are very interesting and useful. They have wide applications in other tasks as well. This is the background information. I will skip it since it is the same as what I just mentioned. This is the outline of this lecture. It looks like there are a lot of contents, but there are actually not that many. Although there are quite a few subsections, they form merely three parts. In the first part, I will revisit the problem of mean estimation, which we already learned in the last lecture, through a motivating example. By revisiting the problem from a different angle, you will get a deeper understanding of it. In the second part, I will introduce the Robbins-Monroe algorithm, abbreviated as RM algorithm. It is a classic algorithm in the field of stochastic approximation. After learning it, you will find it elegant and powerful, capable of solving many problems. The third part is about stochastic gradient descent, which is actually a special case of the Robbins-Monroe algorithm. We will also introduce batch gradient descent, mini batch gradient descent, and stochastic gradient descent, and then compare these three methods. Finally, I will provide a summary. Now let's look at the first part, the motivating example. First, let's revisit the problem of mean estimation. Consider a random variable x, our goal is to estimate its expectation, E, X. What do we have? We have some independent and identically distributed samples Xi from 1 to N. How do we use these samples to estimate the expectation? We take the average of these samples, which gives us X bar. This X bar is considered an approximation of the expectation. We already discussed this in the last lecture, and it is the basic idea of the Monte Carlo method. We also know that the average will gradually converge to the true expectation when we have sufficient data. Why do we care about the problem of mean estimation? Because in reinforcement learning, we need to estimate many expectations. For example, state values are defined as expectations. There are also many other expectations that we need to estimate from samples. So here we consider the problem of mean estimation once again. Now, we have a new question. How can we calculate the mean x-bar? You might think this is a simple question. Isn't it just the sum divided by n? This is just one way. The drawback of such a way is that if the samples are collected one by one over a period of time, we have to wait until all the samples are collected. Another way can avoid this drawback. It is in an incremental and iterative manner. The basic idea is to calculate the mean as the samples come in. This way is more efficient. Let's examine this way in detail. For k samples from x1 to xk, we calculate an average, denoted as wk plus 1. It is the sum of these samples divided by k. Here, wk plus 1 can also be written as wk. The reason we write it as wk plus 1 is that its expression will be relatively simple. Given the definition of wk plus 1, what does wk look like? It's very simple. It is the average of the first k minus 1x i values. What do we need to do next? We need to establish the relationship between wk plus 1 and wk. 
In fact, wk plus 1 can be expressed in terms of wk. wk plus 1 is defined as an average. This is the sum of the first k samples xi. We can split this sum into two parts. The sum of the first k minus 1 samples and the kth xi, which is xk. This part is related to wk. If we multiply this by wk, we will see that this sum is equal to k minus 1 wk. By reorganizing this equation, we get this new equation. Let's take a closer look at it. The left side is wk plus 1, which equals wk minus 1 over k times wk minus xk. This gives us an iterative algorithm. For example, if we have calculated wk at the previous step, and we get a new sample xk, then we can use this equation to get wk plus 1. We do not need to summarize all the previous k samples and then calculate the average again. Let's next verify if this algorithm is valid. Initially, we have x1, which gives us w1. Then what is x2? According to the equation, x2 equals w1 minus 1 over 1 times w1 minus x1. Since w1 is equal to x1, this results in 0, leaving x1. Therefore, w2 equals x1. For w3, we substitute w2 equal to x1 back into the equation. This is x1 and this is x1. After some calculations, we get that w3 equals 1 half times x1 plus x2. Following this pattern, we get w4 equals 1 third times the sum of x1, x2, and x3. Finally, wk plus 1 equals 1 over k times the sum of the first k samples. In summary, this gives us an iterative algorithm for calculating the average. The advantage of this algorithm is that at step k, we do not need to summarize all the previous samples xi and then calculate the average. With one step of calculation, we can get a new and correct average value. Although calculating the average is relatively simple and can be done in many ways, this example illustrates an important idea. Incremental calculation. Initially, when wk is based on a small amount of samples, it may not accurately approximate ex. However, it's better than nothing or waiting until the end to get an average. During this process, even though wk is not accurate, it can still be applied to some tasks. As more samples are obtained, wk can approximate ex more accurately. This algorithm can be further generalized. Previously, the coefficient was 1 over k. Now we can replace this coefficient with alpha k, where alpha k is a positive number. If alpha k is 1 over k, as we showed earlier, the series of equations allow us to explicitly express w1, w2, and w3 as the average. However, if alpha k is not 1 over k, then its explicit expression cannot be obtained. Can wk still gradually converge to the mean ex in this case? The answer is yes. If alpha k satisfies certain conditions, this algorithm will converge to ex, which we will discuss in detail later. Through these examples introducing the algorithm, I want to highlight that this algorithm is actually a special case of stochastic approximation algorithms. It is also a special case of stochastic gradient descent algorithms. When we encounter the temporal difference learning algorithms in the next lecture, they will not surprise us because we will see that those algorithms have similar expressions. By studying these related algorithms in this lecture, we will establish a very good foundation for the next lecture.